signs. They're given to us by the Creator. The linguistics of the Quran itself is a miracle. It's not reproducible. It's in period. It's not, re it's not re replicable. Uh, the, the social laws of Islam, we have seen that according to now how the, the, the world has come into such a chaos, that many of the social institutions of Islam, economic institutions of Islam, just uh, judicial institutions of Islam, would eradicate many of the world's problems that we experience right now. Many of them, if not all of the world's problems, I agree with challenge that all, almost all of the world's problems could be solved, solved as a humanity from laws that are derived from this very book. So that's, that's my proof, is that the burden of proof has been given to humanity. And I've tried for the past for, uh, 14 years to, to, to look at some of these accusations that have been made uh, by websites like Enter and Islam, you know, all of these things that they put all these things. But the burden of their proof, when you actually put it in the light of the book itself, they don't match up. They don't match. What they call a contradiction is actually very clearly uh, stated in the interpretation. And what they actually would say was a misscientific proof is actually a mistranslation that they have taken from the original language. Uh, so all of those things are there. That's, that's, that's what I would say is the proof. And that if somebody, and this is my challenge to you, all of our uh, non-Muslim guests, if you think that the Quran is imperfect, it's untrue, please bring it to me. Please. I, I can give you my website, it's uh, my name, LushaEdens.com. My name.com, LushaEdens.com. Give me the proof. And I will look for it, and I will go in, and I will look at what you send me, and I will reply. And if you show me a proof, then you will have enlightened me and two billion Muslims in the world. And if not, then you may just find for yourself proof. And that, that would be the greatest gift that you will receive in life. So I, I, I know that kind of went, went a little too long and roundabout, but that's the burden of proof is there. Please help me, show me. Okay, any more questions? How other people viewed Islam. So I went into this website called uh, uh, Christian Encyclopedia, and they were talking about Islam as Mohammedanism, and they were saying that the problem with, this, uh, the, with the tradition of the Prophet, peace be upon him were not assembled as when he was alive and it's full of, um, um, you know, traditions and that kind of stuff. So I was wondering from your point of view as someone who's been an outsider of Islam, how do you see that and how, you know, how, uh, what do you think about that? Thank you. With concerning the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, these were Okay. And even, even the relation to us of the Quran, there is the same uh, light that shed upon them. Now, I don't mean to sound condescending in any manner, but for someone to use that as an evidence of the, of, of the collection of the Quran, the collection of Hadith, is someone who has no idea of the science of Hadith verification. I mean, none whatsoever of the science of Hadith. They have not even a glimpse, because there are even Muslims that do this. This is not just non Muslims. <laughs> there are Muslims who do the same thing. Uh, even against the Quran itself, so But it's someone who has no idea about the science itself. Um, when it comes to the Qur'an, the Qur'an is a little bit easier because it was written down during the time of the Prophet peace be upon him but not collected. That's the difference. That's the problem people make is they say it was not written down during this time. It's false. It just was not collected into one book. It was always written down. The Prophet peace be upon him had a personal scribe that he had to write the Qur'an down for him. It just was not completed and compiled. But uh, after the Prophet, peace be upon him's death, it was compiled. It was given the charge to the same person who used to write it for the Prophet himself, was charged to find it and collect it in one book. And there is, of those copies that were made, there were seven of them. The one still exists to this day. Uh, and it's in, in Turkey. Uh, it's the, called the Uthmanic uh, script copy, or it's called the copy of Uthman, because it was owned by one of the Prophet's dearest companions, Uthman. It even has bloodstains of his, his own bloodstain when he was assassinated. It was kept in his home. It's huge. It's like, it's, it's ginormous. I don't even know how they did it. <laughs> you couldn't carry it anywhere. But anyway, uh, so that's a little bit easier because we do have an original. Uh, there's a original. We want to go check it. It's right there. Um, but as far as the hadith literature, to say that every statement of hadith is coming from the Prophet is a lie. It's not. Uh, there are many hadiths that are fabricated. There are many that are weak. Um, but these were spoken about orally 
in the first couple of generations of uh, Islam uh, because of the simple fact that the Muslims were so trustworthy amongst each other at that time. Everybody had seen and heard the Prophet, peace be upon him. But after the death of the third Caliph Uthman, that's what's called the Great Fitna, uh, when people started inventing lies uh, and attributing to the Prophet, people started to check and question, who did you narrate from? Who did you narrate from? Who did you hear this from? And that science of who did you hear this from and checking it against other things has existed since that time. It was only defined a couple hundred years later and we still use that science today. So when someone says that they have verified a narration of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that's not like they just read it in a book. That verification process is so complex and lengthy that it's almost an impossibility of lying. It's like saying that 30 people say the exact same thing and none of them ever met each other and none of them live in the same place or at the same time but they all narrate the same person, the same story from the Prophet peace be upon him and there's 10 different chain of narration. To say that all of them conspire together to say the same lie, even though they never met each other, never lived in the same, I mean these are just one science uh, that is an impossibility for this lie to have been fabricated. So this is the difference with the Hadith literature is that there are authentic ways to, to verify these documents. It's not like they found some documents just lying in a, in a dust heap somewhere. No, these, these have been passed on and verified ever since uh, the time of the companions of the Prophet peace be upon him. And when the lie is known, it is stamped by the scholars as this is a lie, it's a fabrication, and it's tossed out. Uh, it's just very simple. If it's, if it's a lie, it's tossed out right away. Even if there's some ambiguity that we don't know, it's tossed out. If we don't know, it's just left. It's just left as we don't know. We don't know who said it, we don't know this chain of narrative, I don't know who he is. So this hadith is not authentic. It is known as unknown. It's a broken chain, there's all kinds of things. But that's just coming from someone who doesn't know these sciences. It is a deep, deep science. Any other questions? Any other questions? Please well, forgive yeah, me if I don't actually to... see you. <laughs> um, in your right, how does the God of the Bible differ from the uh, the God of the Quran and sort of what is it pointing towards? So if Christians look to the new creation in heaven, what are you sort of what are you doing in worshiping Allah? Uh, how do they differ? When I look at the the God of the, the Bible and the God of the Quran, it's it's the same God. I mean, when you look at the direct message of God from the Old Testament, uh, the Quran is 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 a, a spitting image um, that God is one without two that God wants to be worshipped, he wants to be obeyed. This is actually what Jesus himself said, that God is one, hear always your Lord, your God is one. You should love him with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, love your neighbor, love yourself. This is Islam and his basic principles. If you give God his rights, you give the creation its rights. So they are the same, uh, the same God. It's, it's, there's a very beautiful statement that was made by um, the king of Abyssinia, which is now Ethiopia, um, the Negus, what they call him, the Negus. He was, he was given the teachings of Islam by one of the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him. He was telling them about Islam, what they believed about Jesus and God. And he himself was Coptic, he was a Christian, uh, tracing all the way back from Coptic Christianity. His reply was that what you have and what I have are like two rays, two lights coming from the same land. Two lights coming from the same land. And he accepted the religion of Islam. He did, he accepted Islam. And the Prophet peace be upon him died, prayed for him and died. So you know, it's kind of like that. It's 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 kind of like I was reading the same book, but just fine-tuned in a sense. Just fine-tuned in a sense. Like the, the the Quran came as a clarification for me of everything that was mixed up for me in the Bible. What what was kind of mixed up and messed up and didn't seem to fit and didn't seem to go, the Quran kind of came and put everything into its proper perspective, proper place which is what the revelations of God did. They backed up one another, they confirmed one another, they rectified what may have fallen away from one another. And this is what the Quran says it came for. It says, we have come, we have sent with you that which confirms that which came before it. Confirming the Torah, confirming the gospel of Jesus Christ, and just putting it as a final declaration, um, which, is, which is the beauty of that. Um, I hope that makes sense. Any, any other, I think you had a question. Right? Good. Right here. I was just wondering what advice you'd give to other people who find themselves lost and who are looking for God, who want to be closer to God, 
And once you've come to find that truth, how can you be sure that that really is the way for you? What, what should you be looking for? Well, <clears throat> one, one thing I really recommend is uh, a stark realization that I came to is that when I tried looking for God on my own merit, like uh, trying to do it on my own and according to my own merits, I, I really was running in circles. It was not really until I, when my grandmother convinced me with her with a frying pan, um, when she convinced me to look for God, I, I, I got on my hands and knees, I remember that day, because she kicked me out of her house. Um, and, and I said, God, look, you know, I've tried to look for you and I didn't find you. So now I'm asking you, if you want me to know, then you need to help me. You know, so I kind of really just let, let, let it go. I said, if God, if you want me to know, you need to help me. I mean, I'm here. I want to know, but I, I didn't know. Because I came to a realization that it was not between me and, 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 and Christianity or between me and my grandparents or me and this book. No, it was between me and God. It's something that I had to take to my creator. I, and one thing I know for sure, that those who truly ask God to guide them, he does not uh, leave them. Error. He guides those who really want to be guided and will show them the truth. And, and, and there's no, I would say, real litmus test for when you found it. It's, it's just something that you know. I mean, I, I, can, I can say this from, is there anybody else here who's accepted as them? Come for comfort. You got comfort to me? You just know, right? It's just, it's just a thing like you just know. It's kind of like everything is just there. It falls into place. It's a, it's a feeling. It's a very different feeling, but not only is it a feeling, that feeling does not contradict your intellect. That feeling does not cause me to contradict my rationale. That feeling does not cause me to contradict known science and known, known uh, things that are known. It, there's no contradiction between my feelings and what's in front of me. And that was the beauty of it. Very, very beautiful. <coughs> Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay, I'll take the last question. Last question. In any way, I'm going to be out. As soon as you go out, take a left right beside the sun. That's where I'm going to be anyway, so we can. Assalamu alaikum. Um, through, through your experience, what do you think the main default in the Muslim's behavior is hiding the truth, of, the, the beauty of Islam and the truth of Islam? Well, if I knew that, I would I knew that I would be distributing it like a, you know, like a virus pill. Um, there's a lot. It's complex, you know. Uh, it's, it's 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 complex. But but the the problem is very very simple uh, in itself. But the solution is, is complex. There's a statement of Jesus speaking upon. Well, it's it's purported to be a statement from Jesus in the Bible that I think sums up a lot of our problems uh, when it comes to conveying the message. He said that, or purported to have said that, no one would light a candle and then take it into their home and place a bucket on top of it. Because that just doesn't make sense. You don't take a candle into a home and place a bucket on top of it. No one benefits from that. But yet they would take that candle into their home and then let everyone benefit from the light. You see, that's the problem, is that Muslims have the most beautiful light. We do, seriously. We have the most beautiful light. And even our book tells us that the Creator is the Noor, the light of the heavens and the earth. And, and that light, when you really, really live that lifestyle of believing in your Creator and worshiping Him, that light reflects through you. That beauty can be seen. It is visible. I know this for myself. I've seen it. You know those people you just look at and you're just like, my God, this guy is just like, he's glowing. And it's the religion that does that. But unfortunately, what a lot of Muslims have done is they have taken that beautiful light of Islam and they have just put a bucket on top of it. No one can see it. Whatever analogy you want to take that out, they're not living Islam in their lifestyle, yeah, that's a way to put a bucket on top of it. They don't tell anybody about Islam, yeah, that's another way to put a bucket on top of it. They completely hide their own Islam, that's another bucket. But there are lots of ways we put buckets on it. But either way it goes, the only thing that we need to do is find out what it is that's our bucket and just take it off so that people can see the light itself because it's beautiful. Islam, I mean, from, take it from an outsider, when you get a chance to actually see real Islam, real Islam, it's gorgeous, it's amazing, it's beautiful, it's, it's equitable, it's just, it's, it's, I mean, I could just go on and on about that. It, it, it would do the world such a justice that, that the thing that people are, are taught to be afraid of, and I've learned this through journalism, uh, psychology, I try to 
minor journalism, but I eventually got out of that. 